Thank you for inviting us into your home. I'm glad that you did not dress up in your church clothes today. Pajamas and slippers were just fine for this service. In the midst of this dire news that we're experiencing these days, we also have something to celebrate. Roland and Mary Lou Pam are grandparents for the first time. We celebrate the birth of Roland Christopher Pam III. Mother and child are doing well and home from the hospital. Feel free to sip coffee or drink tea during the sermon, but please refrain from texting or answering emails. Seriously, we hope you will be fully present and that the message this day speaks to your lives. And now, the call to worship. Those who turn to the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. invite you to pause the video and continue worshiping on your own by using the order of worship posted on the home page of our website. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have received your concern for, your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I, I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Are you spending the majority of your time sheltering in place? 
I hope you're able to get outside occasionally for some fresh air or to see the colors of spring. Even then, you may be feeling as if you're under house arrest. Thinking about this lockdown we're all experiencing made me think of the situation of the Apostle Paul. When he wrote his letter to the followers of Jesus who lived in Philippi, he was in prison. However, he was not voluntarily sheltering in place. He was imprisoned by the Romans. He was unable to take a stroll outside or to go to the market to shop. Worse, he was awaiting trial for encouraging people to believe that Jesus, not Caesar, was the Son of God. That Jesus, not Caesar, was the real king. That Jesus, not Caesar, was the one to whom you should pledge your allegiance. That Jesus, not Caesar, was the one to trust. Of course, this amounted to treason. And since Paul had no intention of backing down or modifying his message, in all likelihood, he would be executed. Now, none of us like being confined. Not only do we enjoy our freedom, but sheltering in place can produce numerous negative emotions. You may be feeling anxious or lonely. You may be afraid or battling disease. You may be feeling panicky especially if you're out of work and not being paid right now. You may be wrestling with an illness or depression. However, sheltering in place is very different than being imprisoned by the government and waiting your date with the gallows. Paul's situation was much more extreme than ours. So how did he cope with his situation. Our passage reveals the remarkable. Paul was feeling neither depressed nor fearful. In fact, he was jubilant. No, he had not fallen off a cliff. He was not off his deep end. He had not been smoking anything with hallucinogenic properties. So, what did Paul have that would get him through this surreal and unsettling time? Some have compared our current crisis with the terrorist attacks of September 11th. That too was a very disturbing time. We experienced shock. We could not believe what had happened. It took some time for it to really sink in. As now, that seemed unreal. Many of us were anxious. We wondered where the terrorists might attack next. For weeks, I would have this eerie feeling every time a jet flew low overhead. I had that same eerie feeling a week ago when I went to the grocery to stock up. As I walked past other shoppers coming down the aisle, I could not help but think, I wonder if they might have the coronavirus. When I reached for an item on the shelf, I wondered who had put it there, who had touched it. Had they had the virus? We would have to be totally numb right now not to feel some degree of anxiety. Who doesn't worry that this deadly virus might get one of our, young, our loved ones? Who does not worry about catching it himself and then wondering if we would survive it? There are some similarities between now and September 11th, but there are also some very stark differences. Back then, people flooded into the churches. 
People yearned for an infusion of faith and they wanted to be together with their church family. They knew how healing that would be just being together. Today, we know we must lean heavily on our faith, but we're prevented from being together. We cannot experience that healing that occurs when people pray together, when people sing together, when people embrace each other with Christ-like love. What do we do in this time of empty streets and closed stores and hospitals that are overwhelmed? How do we soldier on while hearing about desperate shortages of masks and ventilators and other urgent medical supplies? Well, we can begin by acknowledging our fears and anxieties. It helps to talk. We can talk with a friend or a pastor. Bottling up the emotions will not help them subside. Most likely they'll fester and each bit of bad news will just fill them with more power than they really deserve. Sharing our fears and anxieties can get them out in front of us so that we can handle them. There can be healing in simply knowing that others are sharing these same emotions. We're not alone in our thoughts. We're not the only one feeling mental distress. Now Paul had to have known fear and anxiety. He was beaten on numerous occasions. He was nearly stoned to death. He was shipwrecked. He was imprisoned. Experiencing such harrowing episodes so many times, terrorized, he must have been well acquainted with fear and anxiety. Yet, instead of writing a letter of lament, instead of crying out, Why me, Lord? Instead, he was jubilant. He wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. Do not worry about anything. Now, if anyone who has lived a privileged life said these words, I would write them off immediately as the folly of someone untouched by pain. But knowing the ordeals that Paul endured, we are obliged to pay attention. Perhaps we find a clue in what Hildegard of Bingen said. She was a 12th century mystic who wrote, We need to fly with two wings of awareness. One wing is an awareness of life's glory and beauty. The other wing is an awareness of life's pain and suffering. If we try to fly with only one of these wings, we will be like an eagle trying to fly with only one wing. To put it into context with Paul, I would say that life includes both suffering and rejoicing. And it's not simply one than the other. Often both are present simultaneously. I think that's what we're seeing today. On the one hand, there is the suffering and fear produced by the coronavirus. On the other hand, there are so many courageous and selfless people who inspire us with their refusal to surrender to fear. Doctors and nurses and healthcare workers dare to put their lives at risk so that they can help people who have contracted this deadly disease. They put themselves in harm's way out of an allegiance to saving people's lives. They literally suffer for others. 
Could anything be more Christ-like? Paul is saying we must choose our focus. Will we obsess on anxiety or will we trust God? His answer is, do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayers of thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You see, the Paul, the, the key for Paul for handling this misfortune is prayer. It is constant prayer for at least three reasons. First, prayer sharpens our awareness that we are not alone. God is with us. God is not controlling the situation. God is not dictating the future because that would rob us of our freedom. Rather, God is with us to strengthen us in the moment and to assure us that come what may, we are perpetually in God's care. An active prayer life creates that assurance in our soul. Second, prayer can generate a heart of gratitude. Paul had discovered that no matter how terrible his situation, he could always point to blessings Nurturing a grateful heart drains the potency out of fear and anxiety. These negative emotions cannot dominate a grateful heart. And finally, prayer spawns a confidence that our Creator is a God of resurrection. Joy is not a hidden gem that only emerges when the wind is at our back. God draws light out of the darkest places, and God brings life out of places given up for dead. As Paul faced an uncertain future when he wrote this letter to the Philippians, we too face an uncertain future. We have no idea how long we'll have to continue sheltering in place. We have no idea how long this pandemic will last. However, I do know this. This crisis is screaming at us to ramp up our prayer life so that we will have the emotional confidence and the spiritual stamina to weather these unsettling days.
During our time of prayer, I will leave moments of silence for you to lift your own petitions to God, either silently or aloud. We will close each of these moments with the refrain, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God, our hope, who stirred dry bones to life, who summoned Lazarus from the tomb, you are the resurrection and the life. The grave is no match for you. In these days that seem shrouded in death, we call out to you, as did the prophet Ezekiel, as did Martha of Bethany, as did so many of our ancestors in times when death appeared triumphant. Not unlike Ezekiel, surveying that bone pile, we look around and see devastation in reports of the virus spreading, in reports of the economy tanking. God, our spirits are weary, our souls are parched, we long for your spirit to sweep over us, to draw order out of chaos, to stir dry bones to life, to make all things new. So out of the depths we cry to you, for we trust that you hear our prayers. For those suffering directly from COVID-19 and those caring for ailing bodies and afflicted spirits, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those reeling from the effects of this outbreak, whose uncertainty is compounded by a lack of security or resources, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those struggling with other crises or conditions, which persist even now in the midst of a pandemic, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who stand at the tomb and weep, mourning the loss of life and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our hope, who declared to dry bones, you will live again. You take off our sackcloth and clothe us in joy. So during these Lenten days, we cling to the hope of Easter. We cling to the promise of eternal life. We cling to the assurance that nothing in all creation can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. May your grace and love strengthen us in hope, fill us with peace, and sustain us in joy as we strive to do what is honorable, what is commendable, what is just for the sake of the gospel. By your spirit, breathe new life into us and awaken us to signs of your creative work so that we might proclaim resurrection hope in these uncertain days. This we pray in the name of your Son, who gave us words to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.